All right, that's three o'clock and here in South Africa and good afternoon from Johannesburg to all of you, wherever you may be. Welcome to this um, discussion. My name is Matthew Simmons. I'm the Executive Director of Economic Research Southern Africa. And this is the second of four events that have been put together on research done by Economic Research South Africa and the International Food Policy Research Institute, supported by the German Investment Corporation. The first event, I think it was about three weeks ago, focused on monetary policy. And the material for that is, as well as a recording um, of the event, can be found on the URSA website, econrsa.org. This uh, today's event looks to contribute to the broader debate in the country about how we can achieve a more equitable and wealthier society. The issues we want to investigate relate to how a more dynamic and growing eco economic base can generate significantly more economic opportunity and do so more equitably. This con the conversation is going to be contextualized by two papers. The first paper looks at the recovery of the South African economy from the COVID crisis in the short term. In this sense, it contributes to answering the question, what can be done to limit the impact of such a significant and temporary event on the economy? The second paper takes over from where the first paper ends in the sense that it looks beyond the short term recovery and engages with what are the structural features of the South African economy that prevent it from creating many more jobs and thereby contributing to greater equality in economic opportunity. Today's session will be chaired by witness Simbana Gavi, a lead economist at the South African Reserve Bank. Presenting the two papers are Sherwin Gabriel from IFPRI and Andreas Vorgotter from the Technical University of Vienna and also a visiting uh, fellow at the South African Reserve Bank. They are joined by two expert discussants, Murray Lebrandt from UCT and Romain Duval from the International Monetary Fund. The format of the event is that we will ask the chapter authors to briefly overview the main messages arising from their papers, whereafter we'll engage in a broader discussion of the issues. We greatly welcome any comments or questions that you have. When raising a comment or a question, please try and do so in the Q&A window. But if for some reason that's not working out for you, we will also monitor messages in the chat window, but please try and address them to the full audience, not just the panel. We'll do our best to incorporate those comments or questions in our discussion. With all that said, let me hand you over to the chair. Witness, over to you, brother. Um. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Matthew. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I assume it's afternoon, but if it's morning, good morning. Uh, so this is uh, uh, turning out to be a very sort of, uh, or looking out to be a very exciting uh, session where we are going to look, look at um, a recovery, South Africa's recovery from the pandemic and of course the way forward in terms of uh, where do we go post the recovery, how do we rebuild? So I'm not gonna take uh, much of your time. Um, I'm gonna introduce the speakers, uh, as, as Matthew has mentioned, we have a distinguished panel here. Uh, Andreas Ogata, uh, very much experienced, very has worked a lot on South Africa. And, and so in fact, all the panel members, they are really experts on uh, development issues and, and especially on South Africa. So I think we are going to benefit a lot from that. So we are going to have two presentations, 10 minutes each. Uh, the first presentation will be by Sherwin who is going to talk about the short-term recovery uh, uh, from the COVID, and then followed by a 10-minute presentation by Andreas to set the scene in terms of the work they have done. And then from there, we can, we're going to pick up and sort of have a dialogue uh, uh, between the, among the panel members. So with that, I want to, to, to hand over to Sherwin to take us through uh, the first paper. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, if you just bear with me briefly, there we go. 
Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone tuning in to today's uh, URSA discussion. Uh, my name is Sean Gabriel. I'm a researcher at IFPRI uh, and I'll be presenting work that uh, our group has done um, on modeling the impacts of policy scenarios in South Africa to support vulnerable households and assist in economic recovery over the short term in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so before I, I, I begin, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge support from GIZ, URSA, the South African Reserve Bank and PIM uh, for this research. As well known, South Africa was negatively affected by COVID-19 and measures to limit its spread through movement and activity restrictions. Uh, the government has lifted many of them using an alert level based system informed by the extent of infections and the pressure this places on the health system. So many firms have benefited from the reopening and adapted to the regulations, but a large number of them uh, continue to be marginalized uh, from continued restrictions on contact intensive activities or persistent low demand due to cautious behavior. It's clear that although some actors in the economy have been able to move forward, others, notably uh, poorer households, unskilled workers, and firms that rely on tourism or investment demand are being left behind. Um, so GDP fell by 17.8% in the second quarter of 2020, and after the lifting of restrictions, it's now at around 3% below uh, 2019 levels. This hasn't been the same experience for employment. Uh, national statistics suggest that the initial impact on jobs wasn't as large as GDP, Still, the improvement in employment has not matched that of, uh, of output, suggesting that as has been the case in recent years, the employment elasticity uh, is less than one and employment is not as responsive to GDP growth. Current employment uh, is at levels last seen in 2013 and the official unemployment rate at 36.2% uh, is the largest in, in uh, post-apartheid post South Africa. Most industrial sectors, um, as well as trade and transport services, have, were, hot, were hit hard initially. Um, and construction and transport services have recovered a little, but are still very weak. And this comes from a lack of investment uh, amid continued uncertainty, as well as caution in passenger transport. After broad-based broad -based declines uh, in the second quarter of, of 2020, the sharpest of which comes from lower investment, household consumption and exports recovered quickly. But the improvement in household consumption at the aggregate very likely masks large differences between, between household groups, as over half of aggregate consumption represents that of the wealthiest 20%. Drawing from the nits cram surveys done throughout the pandemic, a large proportion of households report having run out of money for food at some point during the month. The latest estimate is at around 35% of respondents, which is lower than 47% at the beginning of the pandemic, but still higher than the 25% of households estimated from GHS 2018. Similarly, at 14%, 14 percent uh, of households report uh, a child going hungry in the latest survey. Shepa, David and Leibrandt uh, developed a measure of lockdown, uh, lockdown readiness and found that only 9% of households in the first quintile are fully prepared. They also find that these households are most susceptible to, to infections. Indeed, recovering from the pandemic is urgent, but for as long as COVID-19 remains a serious public health issue, it seems likely that some of those restrictions may still be necessary, as we saw in the last month or so. Given the still high incidence of hunger, uh, unemployment, and an uneven recovery, we asked whether policy intervention could assist vulnerable households and promote recovery in the short run, during which there's still a large degree of pandemic risk. Now, this is distinct from a long term building back growth path, which would focus more on structural interventions. It's also distinct from something that tries to tackle poverty and inequality in a long term sustainable way. Uh, the, the, method in, uh, the method that we've chosen assumes that over the short run, there are no changes to relative prices or no distortions uh, caused to, to how uh, agents in the economy uh, behave or allocate resources, and there are no trade offs on investment. So for short run analysis, the, we, we deem that this is appropriate because the, the temporary nature of the interventions that we, that we looked at uh, wouldn't be sufficient or lasting enough to cause these kinds of uh, distortions. We ran eight scenarios comprising two levels of income support and three ways in which each are financed. Uh, so under a full intervention, this involves a combination of topping up grant, existing grants and allowed uh, a COVID specific grant called the Social Relief of Distress Fund to continue for a year. We also had a reduced intervention in which we only continue the social relief of distress fund. How this gets allocated to households depends on existing distribution patterns. So as you can see on the uh, chart on the right, 
uh, you know, old age grants and disability grants generally uh, are taken up by uh, the middle uh, section of the income distribution, while the child support grants and the COVID SRDs uh, are broadly taken up by the, the bottom 40%. Um, so for each of these, we reduce the, an equivalent amount from either government savings, uh, government expenditure, or increase gov direct taxes on the top decile as a way to fund the interventions. In addition, we considered a wage subsidy, which transfers the money to primary and middle educated labor instead of direct transfers to households. We found that the full intervention financed by lower government savings adds around 2% to GDP. Uh, and this is because it's the least restriction, least restrictive option uh, that, that uh, in the current year. And another reason is because we, we've assumed that investment isn't, uh, isn't endogenous in the model. It has no, no feedback effects. Uh, when financed by higher taxes, we find that the intervention still positively affects GDP, albeit to, to a lower level. And this is because uh, the tax reduces disposable income of wealthier households, which, as I mentioned earlier, are an important part of um, aggregate consumption spending. Um, but interventions financed by reallocation of government spending, we find uh, negatively affects uh, GDP. Uh, so, you know, this is this is taken both at, uh, you know, we, we find similar results at the reduced intervention, uh, albeit at, at a smaller level, firstly, because of the um, or mainly because of the, the size of the, of the intervention. All the scenarios that we modeled are pro-poor. The Palmer ratio, which takes the ratio of the income of the top 10% to the bottom 40% of households, falls from four in our baseline to around 3.5 and 3.8 under the full intervention. And this is by design. The grants are intended to benefit poorer households, and in the scenario targeting a tax change to fund social support, uh, there is compression of income at the higher end as well. Importantly, it's important to, uh, one should notice that the wage support is less effective at reducing the Palmer ratio. And this is because uh, the way, um, or this is because much of the support is likely to go to middle educated workers, as we can see on the right hand chart. Uh, most of middle educated workers are found in the sixth to ninth income decile. So a lot of the direct effect of wage support will escape the lower 40% of the income distribution. Um, so as I've said, it's, there's an urgent need to reverse the negative impact of the pandemic and lockdowns. Uh, but again, as restrictions remain a risk, um, re restrictions remain a risk for as long as COVID-19 poses a threat to, to the health system. Um, given that poor households are, uh, are the least prepared and most vulnerable, um, and because recovery has been imbalanced, there may be a case to uh, to have these temporary interventions um, to, to support, to, to provide an important cushion for vulnerable households. However, these shouldn't be uh, mischaracterized as being a long-term solution. Uh, and, and this is because of the, you know, we've assumed that over the short run, there are uh, fairly low uh, 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 or short run price effects and no allocative and behavioral uh, trade-offs to consider. Um, but these are important uh, to take into account for the long run if you wanted to extend it for a more permanent time. Uh, given you know, existing constraints in the South African economy, there's little scope to expand these interventions before the economy starts hitting um, speed limits as pre-pandemic structural constraints. And you know, as the vaccination program helps reduce risks on the health sector, uh, it, it makes sense to start moving back to addressing uh, so, uh, you know, important structural growth constraints. Uh, the reform agenda already emphasizes improvements in network industries and competitiveness to improve economic performance and employment. Um, and the impact and consequences of COVID-19 have also brought forward the importance of building resilience and enough policy space uh, to support vulnerable groups. So an inclusive and post-pandemic trajectory needs to give focus to this, uh, particularly on the development of health and food systems, skills development in a rapidly changing business landscape, urban structure, and also the role of the public and private institutions in driving these changes. Um, and, and, and that's all for me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Sherwin. Um, so I think we are going to move straight to Andreas uh, before opening up. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Now, um, I'm not sure whether I am capable to, well, I think um, 
uh, Margot is, is helping me with, with the presentation. Now we can move on to the next slides. And um, I immediately want to move to the, <clears throat> to the punchline of my presentation, which is that uh, South Africa has uh, uh, a very low labor utilization rate, which means, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Marco, can you can you please move on because I cannot. Yeah, the next one, please. I cannot move the slides myself. Okay, here we are. Now here we see these bars are uh, how far individual countries, like starting with Indonesia, uh, India, Indonesia, and then South Africa, are behind the top fifty percent of um, the OECD average or the <clears throat> average of the top 50% of OECD member countries. So it's a, it's a very ambitious uh, benchmark, if you like. And there we see the blue bar <clears throat> is the productivity gap and the green bar is the labor utilization gap. Now, <clears throat> I mean, as we see for all the countries here on this, uh, in this figure, the blue bar is, is dominating because <clears throat> emerging economies like South Africa or Colombia, China, Mexico, and down to Russia and, and uh, Turkey are behind in terms of productivity, which is GDP per, per uh, person employed. Now, uh, the South African blue bar is relatively speaking small, smaller than the surrounding countries, uh, Indo India, Indonesia, Colombia, and especially Brazil. Yeah? So the South African, South African economy is more productive than the Brazilian economy, but it is not capable to, <coughs> let's say, roll out these productivity opportunities to the total uh, population in working age that is not uh, disabled. So the green bar is dominating for South Africa. This is <clears throat> what I would like to talk about in the next minutes. So if we move on, <clears throat> we see this is more or less the same story, employment rate. This is the bottom line in South Africa is low and stagnating <clears throat> in all other countries in Turkey even in Brazil, yeah, but especially in the <clears throat> emerging economies among former communist countries like Slovakia and Poland and also Russia, employment rate is increasing. And also in mature economies, the employment rate over the past 20 years has been strongly increasing like in Germany. Now, why is this important? We see on the next slide because there is a strong uh, negative relationship <clears throat> between inequality and the income share of the bottom 20%. So um, if labor utilization is low, then a large share of uh, the <clears throat> uh, population is excluded from uh, income earning opportunities which reduces the share of the bottom 20% in the population. And this is where South Africa is. Yeah. South Africa is here in the left corner, yeah, which is uh, <clears throat> characterized by a low share of the bottom 20% in terms of low income share and <laughs> high in inequality measured by um, the Gini coefficient. Now, one, one issue that is frequently uh, mentioned <clears throat> is low growth, which we have on the next slide. <clears throat> of course, South Africa here uh, is characterized by uh, low growth and uh, a high <clears throat> uh, degree of um, uh, uh, labor uh, resource uh, utilization gap, so low labor uh, resource utilization. 
And we see that, um, uh, that even uh, other countries that have low growth like Mexico, Argentine, Brazil, or Colombia, growth here, uh, the growth indicator that I'm looking at is measured in real GDP growth between 1995 and uh, 2005 in order to exclude the global financial crisis and, and also <clears throat> the more recent uh, downturn in the, in the economy. So low growth alone is not, is not the only issue. Of course, let's say if South, Af South Africa would have growth rates like India and China, most likely uh, labor force uh, utilization would also, labor resource utilization would also be higher. Now in the next five slides, I would like to discuss with you what I think are the main, the main obstacles for, high, for higher labor utilization in South Africa. And it is important to understand that an economic phenomenon and low labor utilization <clears throat> is also, a, is not only a social uh, issue, but also and predominantly an economic issue. Um, that that um, <clears throat> is there for, let's say, more than 20 years um, is predominantly structural. Yeah, and therefore most of the <clears throat> of the issues that I will be mentioning <clears throat> in the next few minutes will uh, will deal with this structural issue. But let me uh, start with <clears throat> sort of, and these structural issue issues include both the demand side and the supply side of the labor market and the functioning of the labor market itself. Now, South Africa is characterized uh, by product market regulations and <clears throat> administrative overheads that make it difficult, um, relatively speaking, uh, to open businesses. So what we see in this, uh, in this figure is a comparison of early stage entrepreneurial activity, which is uh, startups and uh, and, and the years afterwards. Um, uh, in, um, in, in South Africa, which is the red um, column compared to many other emerging middle income countries. <coughs> and we see that let's say South Africa is, um, is, is on the left lower side of this uh, spectrum, which means there is not enough entrepreneurial dynamism in the economy that is capable to generate enough new employment opportunities for the relatively large cohorts of, of school leavers and um, labor market entrants that might consider to, to, to look for a job, but to some extent are then also discouraged because they just don't see one. So um, if you like one, one issue that we have identified here is that um, low labor utilization is also a consequence of uh, a relatively low dynamism um, in the economy that doesn't generate enough new jobs. Now, um, an evident um, issue we see on the next slide, <clears throat> and this is the appallingly high youth unemployment rate in South Africa. Now, the number that I have here is from 2008, but if anything, it is even uh, larger now. And, and what is the issue here? I mean, the issue here is that the transition <clears throat> from secondary school to a job just doesn't work in South Africa. I mean, even after the first year, um, up to 90% of school leavers, <clears throat> secondary school leavers, don't have, a, don't have a job and this rate 
takes about 15 years uh, to, uh, to fall towards the uh, even high average uh, unemployment rate in South Africa. So in other words, it takes about 15 years yeah, to get a cohort of South African school leavers into employment. I mean, that's, that, that, is, that is pushing some, uh, some of these school leavers into age groups where they already might be thinking about retirement. And I mean, this is not normal. I mean, that, that cannot, this is just, just not acceptable. And uh, so that is an institutional area where we just have to say the, the labor market does not work. I mean, the labor market does not work for <clears throat> school leavers from secondary schools that do not move on to university. And um, I mean, one, one experience from other countries where well, I mean, every, every country in the world has school leavers, yeah, and, and therefore, and nearly no other country has youth unemployment rates like South Africa. So what are other countries doing differently? Now, some other countries, of course, maybe not immediately transferable to South Africa, but it is uh, worth to, to consider this as an experience, <clears throat> uh, include um, the future employ employers of school leavers much more strongly in the admission to uh, vocational education and training programs, which means that a, fu a future em employer is selecting the participants in these programs in exchange then for an, an, an uh, a prolongation of employment of this, of this youngster <clears throat> uh, when having finished uh, the VEP program. And, and that, that works perfectly in countries like, for instance, uh, Germany. And, and it also has worked in, in Germany when the country had a, an income level that is not very different from what it is uh, in South Africa at the moment. Now, on an, another issue in South Africa, which is maybe uh, very specific, we see on the next slide, and that is the low economic activity in rural areas especially in, um, in traditional settlement areas. I mean, traditional settlement areas are characterized by, <clears throat> contrary to other, other areas, urban areas and farm areas, uh, by a soci sociological structure that is dominated by female heads of households. And uh, the, <clears throat> the men in the, in the household working somewhere else. Yeah? Now, that, of course, is having two consequences. One is that the economic activity in these areas is, is low. And the other, the other is that women find it very difficult to participate in, in employment or in economic activity. And what we see on the, on the next slide is that in those regions, in South Africa, where unemployment is high, there is also a high difference <coughs> between, between male and female unemployment. Um, so um, concerning the traditional settlement areas, I think maybe policymakers should think a bit uh, harder about how to to more effectively target um, programs like uh, BEE and also all the su successor uh, programs. And one idea could, for instance, be to say, okay, <clears throat> we have here these traditional settlement areas. There is an evident need for, for more economic activity. So let us specifically focus and empower black economic activity in these areas. And maybe also in addition, make the leaders, the traditional leaders in these areas uh, responsible for the success of these programs. Um, it might take a bit of imagination to see how that could be done, but I think it would be worthwhile <clears throat> to, 
to undertake this, this effort because uh, unemployment in rural areas is a huge issue in South Africa. And this could be combined with, um, with programs that help women to better <clears throat> reconcile family and job uh, responsibilities. I mean, the, the, the most evident uh, program. Sorry, sorry and, and yes. yes. Can, can you try to wrap up, please, uh, so that we can help them? Um, so uh, the, uh, how to help women, I mean, <clears throat> with institutions that look after the, the children while women are at work, and uh, especially also by making sure that uh, transport opportunities are safe. I mean, that is, uh, I think, very important for women. The final slide that I have is uh, titled that labor market rigidities are mixed. <clears throat> and here <clears throat> I find it uh, worthwhile noting that one institution that, um, that is looking after uh, resolving labor market issues for job searchers and also for for, for employers that are looking for, uh, for, for employees <clears throat> is virtually absent in South Africa, and that is a strong um, public employment service. This public employment service should be organized like a one-stop shop for income replacement, for placement services, meaning bringing together vacancies and job seekers and training in order to um, uh, help uh, job seekers to, to get the qualifications that employers actually need. Okay, thank you very much. And sorry for uh, overstretching my speaking time. No, no, no. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. <laughs> Uh, apologies. So thanks uh, to the presenters. Um, uh, this is very, very interesting. Uh, we need to now move on to the discussions. So I'm, I'm going to open by uh, asking uh, uh, Professor Lebrand, uh, given what we have had uh, of the two presentations. So obviously, I think from a policy point of view, uh, it's a real concern that, uh, yes, a lot of jobs were lost. and But then the recovery, I think that's where the biggest concern is that uh, Recovery in employment has been slow. Recovery in GDP has been much better, as, as uh, Sherwin pointed out. Uh, so, so in, in, the, in that regard, I, I would like to get a sense from you, Prof, um, in terms of your assessment of the interventions, their efficacy. Uh, do you do you feel the interventions have actually sort of uh, uh, delivered uh, as, as you would have expected? And and of course. Uh, uh, in terms of the lessons that we, we, we can draw from this pandemic in terms of uh, what we have learned in terms of possibly like uh, policy efficacy or policy interventions. Yeah, thank you, your witness. Um, so, uh, and thank you for the, the two papers for the pre presenters. Um, a very, very fascinating, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, Sh Sherman's paper with, with Channing and others um does give us a sense of of uh of the of the structure of the economy as it was uh, what they call weak or tepid coming into COVID, um very very weak uh, economy that then got smacked by this huge pandemic um and uh and and they, and they make the case uh, and there's plenty of evidence to support this as well, that the, the, um, the emergency relief measures were effective in terms of what they were supposed to do. Uh, and and um, it, in, it just in terms of some base support, uh, a recognition uh, that is quite well described actually in, in Sherwin's paper, that, um, that companies are quite resilient and households are quite resilient, but you you can't push that to to uh, you know th this was an this was an extreme situation and 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 for example Sherwin's paper makes the case that some of the smaller enterprises couldn't respond to the December um, third wave second wave and now there's a third wave 
uh, they, they'd, they'd used up all their resilience and resourcefulness, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so you need, some, you need some emergency relief measures, both for households and for uh, firms. And, uh, and the package was uh, quite speedily implemented and, and indispensable on its own terms. I guess that's my view. Uh, where, where Sherwin and um, Sherwin's paper then prods us uh, is to say, okay, but now looking forward on the recovery road, you know, um, what, what, do we, what do we keep? Or, um, you know, how, what's the mesh between these emergency measures that, that were based on keeping, keeping the economy in the game keeping households in the game versus now a, a recovery and growth. Um, and, um, uh, and uh, so, so I, I have a, a particular view that, um, th that we're going to need, it's, it was a tepid economy before, and 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 show and, uh, and that's the thing. And I think that that uh, the, the paper that Andreas spoke to is is talks to that economy, talks to what we had before, and talks to the sort of policy environment that was supposed to solve the employment problem um, before COVID, in a sense. And it's still with us. Uh, and. Um, and it's a, an economy that that marginalizes that, that that's not an it's not an inclusive economy and and andres and and uh, uh, the paper talks to that in quite nuanced ways it reviews the various policy options that have been been spoken about um so in terms of support which was your 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 question uh, witness um the uh so some of the support was explicitly emergency relief, and it was designed like that. And and we still have it in place. We still have the some of the key components. We don't have the top up of the of the um, cash transfers anymore of the child support grant and the pension, um, but we 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 just have the the social relief of distress grant back again, um, and uh, and it only went away with with the budget uh, in the in the beginning of this year and um and it's 350 rand and the, the evidence of the the support that it provides to households to 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 stay in the game to be productive to 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 um to be to be part of our society in a productivity sense um there's a strong case that it's uh it, it's necessary we, we've got an unemployment problem that andres spelt out that uh, that is a reality. It's there, and uh, and uh, households, and particularly at the bottom end of the distribution. And to participate in the economy, people need resources. So, so, so there is an active discussion going on in the country right now about uh, how to design a a support package, not the top up of the grants, but for this economically active population. Uh, uh, it 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 it, uh, um, it seems to be it has to be part of the discussion. Uh, at the same time, the the TERS um, grants etc. Um, were a very interesting intervention to to they, they were they were emergency relief grants for sure. Um, uh, but. Uh, and uh, but but they were also designed to reach to the more informal ends of the labour market. And one of the one of the very strong features that comes out of Andreas's uh, paper is that um, is that we've got two issues that we're dealing with here that are both involved in the labour market. We've got the we've got the product market side and the lack of competition in any of our markets in the formal sector. And then we've got the the peculiarities of our bargaining and our labour markets. Um, and and both of those act together to be uh, to be very exclusive of new entrants, new firms, new uh, new labour market entrants, but also new new firms, entrepreneurship. Andres had a slide just now. Um, and what are we going to do to to assist those people into um, 
to, to, to come in. So, so later on, we can talk a, bit, a little about, about structural unemployment and the structure of the economy. Your question was about support. And maybe we've learned something. Uh, certainly the discussion of the TERS grants happened in NEDLAC and, and the decisions were involving business. Maybe businesses had a chance to think seriously about how to be more inclusive. And, and I think the discussion of the firm, the firm support belongs as part of that discussion. Thanks. Thanks very much, Prof. Um, so so I, I, I'll be now going to, to Romain. And, and so the way we want to sort of structure the discussion is to, first of all, talk about this uh, short-term measures versus long-term sort of reform efforts. And then we are going to then go into much more detail, focus the discussion around labor issues. So, 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 so just to let you know about that. So Romain, I think on the same question in terms of um, the lessons that we can say we have derived from this. So first of all, looking at the interventions themselves, uh, uh, this, whether you think given your sort of uh, uh, position, maybe someone who looks at uh, developments that happen globally. If you look at the South African sort of efforts uh, at the short-term measures, and, and also in line with what Sherwin spoke to, what's, what's your take on that? And, and, and do you think we have sort of gotten a, a, a bang for the bank, a for the bank, a bank for the bank? Oh, sorry, a bank for the, bank for the bank. Thanks a lot, witness, and, and first of all, thanks a lot to to you and and uh, you know everyone for for having me today as a discussion to these two very very interesting papers. Um, you know, I, I think so far the authorities' uh, short term response to the pandemic right has been you know even in comparative terms internationally it's been really swift and and powerful and also comprehensive because. Uh, it really cushioned the blow to most affected workers through you know, the unemployment insurance funds, through the you know, temporary COVID-19 grant extensions. It also helped cushion the blow on affected businesses, including SMEs, right, with, with a range of, of, of programs ranging from you know, loan guarantees, deferral of tax liabilities, and, and the like. Right? Not to mention the, the macro policy response, which was also very strong on the monetary policy side, like something you guys discussed a, a little while back. And, and you know, while the pandemic rages, it, it still makes a lot of sense to have targeted relief to most affected workers and, and, and firms, including the, during this COVID wave. Now, of course, the, the issue, and, and you know, that's what we want to discuss today, is we're going to have to gradually transition toward uh, longer term measures because uh, the legacy of this crisis in any event is going to be even higher public debt, probably even lower employment rates, um, low growth, which was already an issue pre-COVID, and these are and, and these problems have only been worsened by the pandemic. Not to mention also inequality, and and you know we think this is going to really require a, a range of structural reforms, including in labor and product markets. Right? Um, you know, there's the structural issue of very low employment in South Africa. You know, if you manage to address it, just to bring employment rates to just average OECD levels or the average of the top five emerging markets, GDP per capita levels could be 50% higher, you know, by our estimates. So this is really a humongous, you know, uh, potential gain from addressing low employment in, in South Africa. And also would have very large effects on inequality, right? If you, if you manage to reduce the unemployment rate by 10 percentage point, the all else equal, the Gini index, you know, the index of, a, of, of aggregate income inequality would decline by three percentage points, which is, again, would be a very large uh, reduction in inequality. And, and the issue, and that's the connection to the short term, is, is that COVID has probably worsened these, these problems and something that I found uh, worrisome, which is also, by the way, in line with South Africa's past response uh, of the labor market to shocks, uh, what I found worrisome is that even you know in Q1 right, 2021, at the time uh, when you know the economy was actually strongly recovering, uh, we had the unemployment rate. The aggregate unemployment rate was still four percentage points below pre-COVID levels, and that you know suggests there's a lack of resilience of South Africa's labor market to this COVID shock, and that's going to further increase the risk of uh, uh, of scaring right, in terms of both low employment and high inequality. And by the way, that's in line with what happened in the past uh, with, with similar, although smaller shocks. Uh, you know, South Africa's unemployment rate responds more strongly to fluctuations in output than the unemployment rate of emerging markets, definitely. 
the responds a lot more strongly and also responds more strongly than the the unemployment rate the to output that the unemployment rate of most advanced economies and we're seeing that again in this crisis so uh and and you know we're gonna i don't want to preempt the whole discussion but i think this this reflects in part actually the the design of, of labor market institutions and, and the need to to improve it uh, thanks very much, uh, Romain. So, so just in sort of building on what you just spoke to now, um, the fact that we, we tend to see that over re response of or unemployment to output fluctuations. Uh, of course, the, the disappointing part would be that, um, well, it's probably it's asymmetric. So when output falls, there's an over response of, of, of unemployment or employment decline. And then when output recovers, you don't see that. So for example, which is probably part of the, a bit of a puzzle at the moment, even for us uh, thinking about what's happening in the economy, we see a lot of uh, sort of encouraging sort of uh, improvements in, in, in economic outputs. Obviously, I think mining has something to do with it, with uh, elevated prices, but I think generally there's a lot of uh, sort of substantial recovery, yet employment remains sort of stagnant. And so, so I don't know if you have sort of some, some idea of what could be, how, how could one rationalize that kind of, uh, outcome. So uh, this is a, I mean, a great question and a deep question, so I don't have a full answer, but some element of answer, though. Uh, you know, the asymmetry, I think, partly reflects the asymmetric adjustment of the labor market to shocks, right? And, and it's not just by the totally specific to South Africa. We know that it's difficult when, you know, a, a, a negative shock hits and, and a shock that would require a decline, you know, in, in wages in particular, to accommodate the shock and keep employment stable, it's very difficult to adjust wages or hours worked, right? And and one is while you know you don't have the same problem on the upside, right? so there's an asymmetry built in in the way wages and hours work can adjust to output fluctuations. And in the case of South Africa, uh, I think the unlike in other countries, think of some advanced countries where wage bargaining has been able to accommodate these fluctuations. Uh, for example, Germany through adjustment in hours worked, right? When, when COVID hit, you had a lot of adjustment in hours work was the same during the global financial crisis. So unlike these kinds of, of countries, you don't really have that in South Africa uh, because the, the wage bargaining system at, at the sector level does not really facilitate these kind of adjustment of either hours worked or wages uh, when a, a negative shock hits. And as a result, you end up with more job losses in, in, in the downturn. So I think that's one factor behind the the asymmetry, uh, but uh, you know, there, there might of course be, be others to the conversation. Thank, thank you very much. So I think that's more or less like a national transition to the next sort of set of uh, issues that I would like us to explore, which have to do with uh, the structural barriers uh, to labor absorption uh, in South Africa. Uh, so, so I think I will sort of uh, uh, go to Professor uh, Librand and, and then uh, to the presenters after that. So, so, so Prof, uh, I, I think one of the challenges, as, as uh, Romain has just pointed out, we, we have this sort of inbuilt maybe rigidities in our, in our sort of uh, labor market or labor policies, which make it rather uh, difficult, which make the adjustment probably when there's a big shock, maybe uh, you, as a firm, it's much easier for you to sort of uh, to overdo the, the retrenchment because you know that at least now nobody will will say, why are you doing it? Because everybody knows what's happening. So you can actually do, sort of instead of doing what is optimal, you can overdo it. And then with the hope that if you need to, you can rehire, but otherwise at least you are easy. It's easier to hire than to fire anyway. So I would like to get a sense from your, your, your viewpoint. Um, uh, so what do you think is, are some of the reasons besides what uh, Romain has spoken to uh, in terms of this structural rigidity or, or for, for sort of blockages or barriers to labor absorption in South Africa. Yeah, that's, that's a, a good question. And, um, uh, you know, Romain was saying two things at once that I think are quite important. One, that there is some response uh, to, to output, to cyclical output movements. You know, employment does respond and, uh, to, to some extent. And then a witness, you said, um, yeah, but the problem is that there's a sort of stock of unemployment that sits with us, that we, that we live with. Uh, 
in, in the economy that almost isn't, uh, that, that, that's what one means, I guess, by structural unemployment or, uh, or the ex lack of inclusivity of the, of the economy and of the growth process. Um, and, um, and so there is some dynamic and there is some responsiveness within the system. Uh, and there's lots of evidence for that besides the, 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 the sort of the fact that employment does respond to the, to the cyclical things and wages have, have been uh, somewhat adjusting the public sector aside, right? There's, there's, been, um, there's been some wage responsiveness uh, through, through the last decade um, in, in the economy. But, uh, uh, and, and there's lots of evidence of, um, of what, what, what labor economists call churning in the labor market where there's, there's a, you know, there's much more uh, coming in and out of the labor market than one thinks with a very ossified view of the South African labor market. Um, Andreas's paper's got a, f a few tables about that, but there's, there's quite a lot of recent evidence about that. Uh, so within that sort of, within a certain labor market, within the formal sector labor market as it's structured and the formal sector economy, it's, it's not completely unresponsive. It's not as though there's nothing going on there. Um, and that's an important point to recognize, uh, but then it leaves on the side the fact that then we need to deal with this, this the structure, the, the, the structural unemployment. And um, uh, so I guess my, my, my uh, one of the points that I wanted to bring to the table this afternoon is that you can't, I don't think one should expect um, the labor regime or wage uh, flexibility it, uh, to, to possibly be able to sort out the big issue. Um, and it's not even the right way, I don't think, to think about, uh, the, to fully think. It's part of, this, part of the story, but it's not the only way to think about the, um, the, the, the labor market even. So uh, Andreas has spent a lot of time talking about the lack of competition in the labor market and the, and, the, and the structure of the labor market that we have and the fact that it shuts out small and medium enterprises. And, um, and, and so, so that's a big picture shifter of the demand for labor. It's a huge big picture shifter of the demand for labor. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's gotta be part of the discussion. It, it, as one moves to, the, to the, the discussion away from short run, coping with COVID, et cetera, uh, back to the longer run growth, inclusive growth, uh, solving the employment problem. So, so the, the fantastic example that Romain gave of exactly what, what a big boost in employment would do to the South African income distribution, as, as has happened elsewhere in the world. Um, but the big issue is, okay, but how do we do that? And, uh, and it's very hard for me to think about a scenario in which, um, in which the, the, the labor regime is, is part of the solution, but it's only a part of the solution. And I don't, you know, and it's, and it's not, it, it's almost counterproductive to play out the scenarios where wage flexibility, uh, it, it, it's a very complicated situation. Um, uh, and I think Andreas's paper was uh, was extremely useful in introducing this this uh, framework from Comforce and Driffle about about the collective action failures of uh, of um, of a regime in which uh, you've got big you've got sectoral very strong sectoral level uh, not not very competitive employment structures you've got quite strong unions organised there. Um, and that can lead to national coordination failures. Uh, it's, um, but the Comforce and Driffle framework pushes one towards uh, Seems like we, are, we have lost both. Is it just me? No, I think we, we've lost uh, Maria. Okay, so so I think we should. Okay, maybe what uh, 
Hello? Oh, okay, you are back. Okay, so um, and I'm finishing off. Well, and yeah. I'm finishing off. I, just, I don't know when you lost me, but and I was in full flight. <laughs> but no, um, I think it's the tail end. So I was just closing out saying that we all we definitely need that sort of uh, a big discussion about the shape of the economy and the inclusivity of the economy, um, and 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 sure the labor regime and the wage bargaining regime has a, has some role to play in that, but it's only a piece of the puzzle. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, Prof. And uh, Andreas, I don't know if you want to sort of weigh in. Um, given your extended experience in this. And Thank you very much. Now, I find it very interesting that uh, a large part of the South African COVID support measures yeah, have consisted by, in, in, or have been brought to the population in form of topping up existing grants. Yeah. Now, why is that interesting? It, it's interesting because actually the recipients of these grants are not part of the of uh, are not economically active. These are pensioners, these are disabled persons, and these are children. Yeah, and for me that means that the government was just desperate in terms of not knowing whom actually to support. Yeah, and and that is uh, for me is uh, the link to what uh, to what Murray said. I consider the South African labor market as not complete because. It is leaving, <clears throat> let's say, a large part of the population that should participate in economic activity idle and outside the labor market. And <clears throat> it is then the responsibility of, if you like, individual actions on the side of employers and, 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 and job searchers uh, to, to find a solution to this, uh, to, to this problem. And, <clears throat> and here we, I'm, I'm those that are faced by this problem. Um, are also facing huge uh, uh, external uh, external effects that uh, they, they they are not compensated for, and therefore, I put a lot of emphasis on <clears throat> let's say creating an institution like uh, Germany or many other uh, European <clears throat> economies have it, a public employment service that is looking after. Uh, the inactive and the unemployed persons and <clears throat> match them with potential employers that are ready to set up a business but cannot do it because they don't have the, 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 the necessary employees and, and workers in order to carry out their businesses. And I think this is, uh, this is for me, this would be a cornerstone of a strategy to put South Africa on a higher growth trajectory. It will not happen by itself, but it has to be supported by an institutional setup <clears throat> that is, of course, uh, respecting South African peculiarities and uh, cannot be just uh, an, an, an import of, uh, of a transcontinental uh, <clears throat> a transfer of uh, institutions. But I think this is this is where, where one should begin. And then, of course, it is very important what Mari also emphasized to open uh, the product market for more entrepreneurial activity and and remove uh, red tape and remove um, uh, regulations that, <clears throat> that 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 make it difficult. That actually are are shaped by following the, the needs and the, and, and the interests of existing enterprises and less thinking about new enterprises. I mean, the electricity sector is a, is a wonderful example here, yeah? I mean, South Africa is facing these, uh, these electricity shortages now since I remember it was uh, starting with the with the World Cup, so that's uh, that's more than ten years ago, yeah. And still, yeah, there is this talk about electricity shortages, yeah. And at the same time, it seems to be difficult for private electricity suppliers to to enter uh, the the market, and and these are obstacles which. 
I mean, need to be removed. Huh? I mean, that's, uh, there, there should be a no, a no tolerance policy in, 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 this, in this respect. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Romain, you want to come in? Well, no, I just wanted really a two hand intervention to, to support what Murray and Andreas said that, you know, low employment problem in South Africa is structural and it's not just going to be fixed through labor market reforms, right? I want to give that impression, although we're going to discuss them, I'm sure, quite a bit, you know. Uh, clearly, it's a multifaceted problem. At the end of the day, you know, at a superficial level, it's a mismatch between supply and demand at you know, prevailing market wages, but you've got problem on both the supply side and demand side. And on the supply side, you know, there's really the issue of low education that reduces employability. There's the issue of high commuting costs. So high transport costs, you know, that can devour up to a quarter of a low skilled worker wage, and that's going to raise the reservation wage, further reducing employment. And on the demand side, it's not just about labor market institutions, indeed, but also a lot about product market regulations. You know, Andres just gave, a, of course, the electricity example, but you can think of barriers to entry network industries in general, right? That is true for, you know, railways, maritime transport, still also a bit true in, in air transport. More broadly, right, there's administrative burdens on startups that, that compare unfavorably to you know, other countries for which, for example, the OECD measures them. So indeed, you really need a, a multifaceted uh, approach. And uh, as Murray uh, you know, pointed out, it can seem a bit overwhelming because you need to start somewhere. But, but I think it's also a reminder that we need a bit of a dose of humidity, right? Uh, South Africa's unemployment rate you know, uh, has been above 20% pretty much since uh, the end of apartheid. And, and, and so it is deeply structural, deeply complex. Smart people have thought about it and, and you know, there's no uh, right, simple solution to it. Although again, I think, and we we'll come back to it, labor market reforms are gonna play an, an important role. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, yes, Shawin, you want to weigh in? Uh, thanks very much, witness. Yes, and you know, Romain's taken a lot of the talking points that I had, you know, um, in terms, I completely agree with 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 the what the discussants have been saying in that, uh, particularly on, on unemployment, this does require a multifaceted approach that goes beyond um, labor markets and labor relations. Um, but I, I think at the same time, the the government is 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 aware of that. Uh, you know, in, if you take a look at, for example, the Treasury's um, uh, discussion documents on on a growth agenda for South Africa. They do talk about some of the other uh, the, the the other influencing factors on the, that that would that, that would affect uh, job search and, and 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 travel costs, for example, by by you know as as you mentioned, um, uh, looking at network industries, looking at uh, at at at, at um, the issue of um, uh, 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 travel time for 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 job search. It it does require. Um, uh, you know, coming at the problem from from several different angles, because I think you can do the most on, on, on one of them, but it won't necessarily solve, you know, a long run structural issue. Uh, at the same time, uh, given the, the longer that we that 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 it takes for us to get out of the, the pandemic, you know, the the risk that, you know, we, we have people who will fall behind more permanently. Uh, I mean, as as one of the one of the charts that I showed describes, you know, there's still this 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 overhang of, of of unemployment compared to that just hasn't gotten back to where we were in 2019. So the longer this continues, um, you know, to, to what extent are those workers stranded? You know, you know, in in, in a much more difficult way, uh, uh, finding much more difficult challenges getting a job again. And at the same time, if you take a look at how some of the adaptation around the pandemic, there's increased use of technologies, and you know, it's 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 bringing to the fore. Um, a lot of the, 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 the constraints of, you know, when you, when you bring technology into the mix, you know, to what extent does this uh, displace particularly unskilled workers? So it does, it does require a, a broader approach than, than just taking a look at, you know, wage flexibility and labor market relations. Um, we, we, we need to find a, a stronger, more sustainable platform uh, to, to make sure that, that the skills um, are relevant for the, for, for the market and that they're, they're, they're easily absorbable by, you know, a large number of firms who, who can operate in, 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 in the environment going forward. No, th thanks very much for that. I, I think it's, uh, what's coming out is very clear that uh, uh, I think from a policy point of view, it's important to really look at this problem, uh, this challenge as, as being multifaceted. So, so you have to address it uh, from different points of view. 
or well, different sort of uh, entry points to make sure that you can make progress. Obviously, the challenge with this is that, um, uh, well, people, of course, want to see progress. And, and of course, as you rightly say, we, we need more reforms. Well, but, but, but government, like, I mean, government is better aware. You look at the NDP, it's very clear that the government knows what the issues are. You look at the national treasury document, very clear that the government knows what the issues are. But, but it's very clear also that uh, there has been very little movement. Obviously, I think in the recent, uh, very few recent months, we have begun to see some, some sort of movement, which might be, I mean, which is rather encouraging. So we have seen uh, the issue of uh, electricity generation by private sector. I think we have a roadmap as to how that's gonna happen. I think, I think government is, is going to open up. And we have seen some sort of reform around, for example, SAA, trying to make sure that uh, you, you, you try to push for productivity and the sort of sustainability of uh, public uh, sort of enterprises which I think is going to, to be helpful. But, but, uh, but it's clear that probably we need to do a lot more than that. So there are a couple of questions that are sort of uh, come in the chat and in the question Q and A. So which I think maybe it's useful to, to, to speak to those. Uh, uh, then if we have time, we can come back to, to the panel, to the panel, panel discussion again. So I don't know, uh, Matthew, uh, if you have some, uh, managed to, to pick a couple of questions that you want to throw to the panel. Yeah, thanks, witness. There, it's it's a it's a tough job. Um, I think all of the questions are very relevant and very important. And we're running out of time, as one always does. Um, everybody says ninety minutes is too long, but it never is long enough. Um, I mean, I think that you know, there's there's one kind of quite technical modeling question that I think is quite useful, Sherwin. I don't know if we can deal with it and deal with it quite um, uh, quickly. Which is the, you know the the extent to which you are able to take account of the multiplier effects of long term income support in the the scenario work you were doing, and what your work means in terms of 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 that debate. Um, there's I think a, a a couple of questions around labor market activation um, comes up in the Q and A as. Um, Childcare and opportunities for women in the workforce, but also a discussion about the public employment services. And maybe if the panel could just reflect on the role of labor market activation policies, um, the significance of the agricultural sector um, as a contributor or a gap in terms of that solution. Um, and then an interesting one that I've just noticed um, from an anonymous. Um, to say policy trends are towards increasing rigidities, the national minimum wage is the most obvious issue. Um, there are other examples of labor regulations coming into the system. I remember reading a little while ago about additional costs and rigidities being introduced in, this, uh, in restaurants and bar industry. Um, and is this the right thing to do in the current circumstances? Let's see what we can do with the remaining time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so yes, uh, any sort of takers? I think maybe we can start with you, Sherwin, uh, responding to that technical question that came through, then we can go to Prof. Mario. All right. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Matthew and Witness. Um, yes, so on, on whether the, the multiplier work that we've done in, in this analysis continue, uh, considers uh, the effects of long-term income support, uh, the, the focus of it uh, was, was mostly on, on the recovery. Uh, to to run a multiplier model on on something that has that that's got to do with long term income support uh, is a bit limited because of the type of assumptions that it makes. Importantly, one needs to consider uh, a lot of the allocative trade offs and the price effects that that this model uh, uh, assumes fixed. Um, for example, how does you know how does long term income support get funded? What are the consequences of of the different types of options that you have here? Uh, does it undermine government spending programs? Uh, does it cause uh, a trade-off where one needs to think about, you know, whether you are supporting um, uh, infrastructure investments, investments in human capital, or you know, uh, or supporting um, uh, expanding the the social safety net? You know, all of those have 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 pros and cons, and it's important to to flesh out these different types of trade-offs where you're testing the one versus the absence of another, um, and and 
also, for example, on the financing side, if you do it through, through tax, uh, the tax framework, given the size of, of how much it, it, uh, uh, it, it would require from the fiscus, would this affect tax behavior and tax morality? So these are important things that we just do not think would have affected the, the decision in such a short run um, uh, uh, income support as, as, you know, as Mary called it, you know, emergency relief measures. Um, these, these aren't intended to deal with the, the structural constraints that we've been speaking about or longer term issues of poverty and inequality. Um, and, the, the, you know, the, there's also another question on whether we'd, we'd taken in, into account endogenous relative price adjustments. Again, the, the modeling framework uh, assumes there's perfectly elastic supply. So uh, given the, the changes in demand, you know, we, we have a fixed price. So it's really the real quantities that are moving. Uh, in order to, to be able to incorporate some of these uh, terms of trade uh, uh, effects, one does need to put those into, into a model that, that does separate out some of the, the quantities and, and the prices. And that's, that's not what was considered uh, in, in, in this modeling framework. Thanks very much. Uh, Prof. Mari, uh, if you want to respond to any of the points that Matthew brought up. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, and, and they're all good and I can't, uh, uh, let me just pick one or two. Um, the, uh, I wanted to respond to the point that, that uh, Anthony Alpierka made about agriculture, because it's symptomatic of, uh, of a lot of the issues we're, we're raising. So if you, if you consider the Brazilian example, where they, where they lowered the inequality quite strongly over a decade, um, a decade of very strong growth. And there's a lot of contention around how did that happen? And, and uh, most of the literature says, yes, okay, um, raising minimum wages were part of it. Um, uh, uh, the, the social grants, the, the Bolsa Familia was part of it. Um, those, if you like, redistribution uh, issues. Uh, but a crucial part of that was that the terms of trade were such that they were very favorable to, to Brazil uh, pr producing some primary commodity exports and they responded in a way and it, it brought regions of Brazil that had been completely excluded from the Brazilian growth process into that growth process. Um, so inclusive in a very direct sense. Um, and uh, that was crucial as well. In, in bringing, and it was an agricultural response predominantly because it was primary commodity exports. And so I'm playing a scenario in my mind right now where, okay, so say that we get a primary commodity boom. Usually it's been gold in South Africa or minerals, uh, but um, uh, the, you know, our agricultural employment and things, that was the point that he was making. Uh, really, uh, would we have the capacity to respond in a way, so we've got a growth stimulus, we've got a growth opportunity. Are we gonna be able to respond to that in a way that it was inclusive in the way that the Brazilians responded? They, you know, the papers have all flagged the fact that people live in the wrong places, there's a rural urban divides, and Anthony's question just goes right to that saying, okay, but what are we gonna do with, with rural employment creation possibilities? Um, and uh, uh, and what's the answer to that? You, you, you know, uh, um, in, in a sense, I think so, some of these interventions that have been mentioned are, are uh, uh, a witness you yourself. Was, we're talking about electricity. You were talking about infrastructure, things that, that are in place for the good of all South Africans to, you know, so that this country can flourish and grow. It's not just, uh, it's not just a business focus. Um, as Ramon said, transport is absolutely fundamental to people being able to look for work. You know, being able to look for work. Um, and uh, so these infrastructure things are, uh, are the obvious place to, to, to look before you start looking. Somebody had a question in the, in the chat about industrial policy. And of course, that might be part of the discussion. We've mentioned competition policy quite a few times this afternoon already, but I, I, for me, the priorities are anything that empowers people, like infrastructure broadly defined, right? So, so, so uh, for sure, um, public transport is absolutely crucial. But, but similarly, as as reviewed in the paper, the, these anything that improves the matching 
between young people and uh, the labor market um, is also absolutely crucial. That's infrastructure. That's, that market doesn't just work like that, right? People mustn't have that view in their heads that that's how the market works. And, and Andreas's paper doesn't have that view. It's very subtle about various forms of interventions. That's, for me, that's infrastructure, right? It's, it's, it's infrastructure that makes the labor market work. Um, and, and the public employment programs that have been implemented in South Africa, particularly the most recent ones, have that focus. They have the focus of, of get young people into a job um, as, as, as a break into the labor market, as something that wouldn't have just happened by the labor market working. Um, so, so I wanna give a, 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 my, my personal a prioritization is, is, and it's quite a conservative view in some senses. It's about the basic functions of policy or to put things in place that enable people to, to, to play their role. Um, uh, so, so you, you know, so my view on the long-term income support for the economically active population is a bit is a bit similar, actually, because if you really look at what it takes, there's a lot of literature in South Africa about what it actually takes to look for a job, and it's expensive. And so I don't know how we expect that market to clear. If if people who most need employment don't have the resources to look for a job. It's just a, a question mark. A, 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 and it's part of my general point. I view that as, as the type of infrastructure people need to actually play their role. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. Um, yeah, so, so just to, uh, for maybe Romain, if you could sort of follow up on uh, sort of similar issues that uh, Prof was speaking to. And, and of course, well, maybe one thing that you could also address is the, the I think the, there's a report that was published by the World Bank recently, which sort of showed that, uh, well, South Africa, in terms of the informal sector, South Africa is probably one of the smallest uh, among, among emerging markets. And of course, that also contributes to the high unemployment rates that we see. Uh, so, so if you could sort of give us a sense of your views on that, uh, vis-a-vis -vis of global uh, international experience, and what kind of sort of policies could sort of help us to move in the, so at least to move uh, a step in the right direction. Thanks a lot, Fitness. Uh, yeah, maybe let me start by taking up the, the, the question, the broad theme of active labor market policies, you know, what we know, what, whether they could help in South Africa, and, and then I move on to exactly what you said. Um, on active labor market policies, I guess it's fair to say that the, the, the overall literature yields mixed results, okay, about the effectiveness of program. Many programs in many countries don't pass really a cost benefit analysis, while some programs actually have fantastic rates of return. So, also in South Africa, the literature on South Africa exists and, and it also yields mixed results, right? The assessments of, for example, the expanded public works program has been mixed. Uh, there's some randomized controlled trials that have shown that in fact, perceived, perceived barriers by employers to keeping workers like tight employment protection legislation. So the difficulty to lay off workers if they need in the future is actually a bigger barrier to hiring than just say the labor costs. You know, there was a program where, where vouchers were given to young people, right? And that they could give employers. So employers would get a very large rebate in labor costs if they kept the young worker. And what you saw was an extremely low take up rate by employers because they just didn't want to bear the, the cost of, of having to, to keep the worker, unfortunately, and, and face the employment protection legislation that, that comes with it. So we have to be, you know, unfortunately sort of, um, you know, a, a bit careful in, in embracing active labor market policies. That said, the literature also points to interesting, uh, uh, I think, avenues for, for reform. So one is uh, on active labor market policies, the, the effectiveness of public employment service. Uh, Andreas spoke about that. There's a very nice section in their paper uh, that, you know, this integration of income replacement, income provision, so the unemployment benefit, job search support and job search monitoring and all of that when it's in great integrated in one stop shop it really helps place you know uh, workers and in particular young workers so that's really something that can be followed through and second i think is also geographical mobility subsidies you know they, they've worked a lot in many emerging in market and developing economies and south africa because you've got this geographical mismatch between you know where the jobs are and where people live they could also be a useful, uh, I think, active labor market policy. 
Now, in terms of the rigidities to be addressed, there was this theme, you know, in our paper that we just released, right, uh, uh, at the IMF, I think we, we take up, so one is on employment protection legislation, you know, is it, the legislation is sort of a, you know, tight de jure in international comparison, but the really the big question is its enforcement. You know, the enforcement is, is burdensome because there's multiple procedures, you know, the CCMA, labor courts, labor appeal courts, it can take very long, and the outcome of it is also uncertain. That is this uncertain lay of costs for the, the firm at the end of the day. And that's likely to make, of course, firms much more wary of hiring untested workers, you know, on which they don't have much information. So think, for example, young workers. And that, you know, that's bound to, to affect, unfortunately, youth unemployment. And also another type of uh, rigidity that I think is worth uh, uh, mentioning on which we've got an assessment is... Uh, is uh, in the wage bargaining system, you know, sector level bargaining can work. It does work in many European countries, but it, it needs some key ingredients to work well. And one is coordination. I think, uh, you know, Murray spoke to that, you know, the common force drill uh, 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 you know, point. But there's also a need for firm level flexibility. You know, in Germany, it's not just that there's coordinated wage bargaining, for example, there's also opt out clauses that enable firms that face distress to opt out from a collective agreement in such difficult circumstances. And you know, in our own paper that I mentioned, we show that even just introducing opt out clauses, just this in, in South Africa could cut uh, average unemployment rate by over two percentage points, you know, which is just ready, pretty you know, uh, limited reform that would have already this effect. And just to finish on informality uh, witness, I would sort of uh, beg to differ, I have to say, about the role of informality for aggregate employment. Why is that? It's because, uh, you know, there's many economies that have even much lower informality rates than South Africa and yet have also very low open unemployment rates. So I, I don't think there's any direct connection between having low informality and having high open unemployment. What I think, though, is there's a, and what we find in our research also, there's, however, a, a connection between um, having a high, having a low informality rate and having a a weak labor market resilience to shocks, right? Because it, it is true that informality is in general not good for the economy, you know, low productivity jobs, poor human capital accumulation opportunities. So it's not good for workers, it's not good for productivity and, and growth, but it is good for one thing and that's to be a buffer, to buffer a labor market, to buffer labor market shocks, right? And uh, in South Africa, you don't quite have that buffer, meaning that when a bad shock hits, what you find in many emerging countries, think in Latin America, for example, is that workers lose a formal job and they take up an informal job. So that at least acts as a buffer. They can remain employed. They have, you know, again, lower wage uh, and they are, they are really looking forward to coming back to the formal sector. But at least it gives them a temporary buffer. And it's true you don't quite have that in South Africa. And, and that partly explains why South Africa's unemployment rate responds more strongly, you know, to, to output uh, fluctuations than, than the unemployment rate of some of these countries that I mentioned. Okay, thanks very much, Romain. Uh, so, Andreas, maybe if you could sort of maybe in a minute or two, uh, just tell us where you. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I just uh, focus on two issues that have been mentioned. One is the minimum wage, and the other one is um, women. Uh, participation in the uh, economy. Of course, if the minimum wage is increased and productivity remains the same, that will result in, in employment losses. Therefore, I think in the public debate about minimum wage increases, one should more also um, emphasize <clears throat> Uh, the message that a higher minimum wage means that minimum productivity has also to increase. Yeah, and this is a this is a message, of course, to workers to participate in lifelong learning, but it is also a message to parents to make sure that their youngsters are participating in <clears throat> sort of the early learning efforts in school and make sure that. That, that they have the, the right um, uh, competences when they are leaving school. And uh, from that point of view, I think a minimum, a sort of a minimum wage uh, increase strategy can be successful also economically, but it has to be accompanied by a corresponding increase in productivity. I think that is, that is an important message. 
Now concerning the participation of women in the economy, uh, I think there is a worldwide consensus about what makes an, an economy sustainable. Of course, there is ecological sustain sustainability and we are all talking now about uh, the efforts to uh, limit uh, climate change. There is also uh, the, the issue of inclusiveness. <clears throat> I mean, an, an economy that is as characterized by inequality like the South African one, but also the Brazilian one, cannot be sustainable on these on these terms. Yeah, and um, I, I think we have we have a, a <clears throat> shared uh, understanding that uh, increasing employment and increasing um, opportunities uh, to participate in gaining <clears throat> income from market related activities is good for reducing inequality and uh, therefore <clears throat> removing obstacles that making it uh, difficult for women to participate in economic activity should also fall sort of in, in, in this uh, overall <clears throat> Uh, a great uh, framework. Otherwise, I, I, I would very much uh, underline what uh, both Marie and, and Romain uh, said about <clears throat> um, the need for a comprehensive uh, approach to the South African uh, inactivity and unemployment uh, issue. And this is one uh, where, <clears throat> let's say, the the focus should be less on uh, those that have already employment. And, and I think we should also remind ourselves that the trade unions have been very successfully negotiating over the last 20 years, um, real wage increasing increases for the ones that, that have employment. I mean, this is, this is a very uh, successful uh, aspect of the South African labor market, but the ones that are left out, I think there we should, uh, we in the sense of South African policy, policy makers and also researchers should uh, focus their attention. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Andreas. Um, given where the time was, was I, do, I do hope that I would be able to give the, the panelists uh, one minute each to sort of uh, give their party shot. But uh, I want to also sort of see some uh, few minutes to Matthew if he wants to do a wrap up. Uh, Matthew, what's your take? Um, goodness, I think we've had a, a very interesting and, 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 and very insightful round of conversations with the panelists. Um, so I think we should look to kind of respect the, the scheduling of the, 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 the meeting and wrap it up at 4.30. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I could probably spend two and a half hours trying to summarize the last 90 minutes. It's been extremely rich and thank you very much to all that's participated. And, you know, often I, 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 I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the questions and comments are from the audience. And these have all been very um, pertinent and, 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 and very useful and specific. So thank you very much to all of you that have attended um, and for contributing as you have. I guess that I, I you know, I often attend these, these, these events and I, I wonder how we change or shift the narrative around these issues in the country. And what I've valued about this conversation so much is there seems to be a, a, a very useful priority in terms of our future narrative around economic opportunity that is coming out of this conversation. I think Murray summarized it very well, but it's, it's, it's shared across all the, the contributions and participants. And the priority that I'm getting from this conversation is simply how do we give people the opportunity to participate in economic activity? And perhaps if we set that as a benchmark against which we measure our policies and measure ourselves in our policy discussions and contributions, we might be able to shift the narrative a little more into a more constructive and contributive 
area going forward. So you're welcome to wrap it up and thank your participants witness. We're all, all done from our side and thank you very much to IFPRI and for GIZ in, in, the, um, in coming together to put the material um, together for this workshop. Okay, so thanks Matthew. Uh, so I think yeah, for me, what's left is just to, to really thank uh, the panelists. I think we, 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 we learned a lot uh, in terms of uh, where, where South Africa should be going uh, from here. And, and I want to also thank the participants for, for attending and also for the questions, as, as Matthew pointed out, very useful. Of course, maybe we, we were not able to address each question individually, but I think what Matthew tried to do was to, to bring together all the questions which are similar and try to, to wrap them into one. So with that, I want to, 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 to thank everybody. And of course, may thank also Matthew, the organizer, and the team behind Matthew, uh, Margo and the company. Thank you very much. This is very interesting. And of course, we look forward to the next seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye.